Very pleased to be joined by New York Times bestselling author John U. Bacon. He's got a new book coming out September the 3rd. I happen coincidentally in a shocking development to have it right here. Overtime, Jim Harbaugh and the Michigan Wolverines at the crossroads of college football. It is a fantastic read, as all of your books are. You're a great chronicler of this sport that we love so much. I want to ask you this to start off. You've written four books that were released in part about Michigan football prior to this one. Why did you believe that this time merited a fifth? I almost didn't, is the, <laughs> is the honest answer. As I said in the introduction, uh, I thought I was dropping the mic in the last one called End Zone. Harbaugh was back at Michigan. Seemed things were back in order, largely on campus and so on. Uh, but then that question became, okay, if you go 10-3 and three a couple times, you don't win a Big Ten title. You don't win a national title, obviously. Um, but you're running things the right way. Is that enough for the fans? If you're Bo Schembechler, basically, Bo did win Big Ten titles, but his bowl record was anemic, no national titles. He's got a statue, and he's got a building named after him. Will that fly today? And that was one of the questions I had. I also wanted to know, from the player's point of view, what the whole thing really feels like and what it means to them. So this applies to any Big Ten program, I believe. Um, you talked to Ben Bredesen, you know, left guard. You talked to Jared Wangler, backup fullback. Uh, a guy like Grant Newsom was knocked out of the game. Uh, what, is, what is it like for those guys? And every school's got those guys. So I want to dive a little bit deeper into some of this, but what you touched on at the very beginning there of, of why write this book essentially almost sounded like you're saying, well, in part it's because he hasn't been over the top successful, right? And I think by just about any definition he's been successful. I mean, the guy's finished in the top 15 three of his first four years. However, we know the big game against Ohio State. He's the first Michigan coach ever to be 0-4 mm -hmm. in his first four games in that one, as you mentioned, has not won the Big Ten. So I guess you responded to it in part, but I, I want to dig a little deeper. What do you say to people who say, why do I want to read about Jim Harbaugh? <laughs> he hasn't done anything to merit this book. Uh, to find out how he ticks, he's probably the most uh, well-known coach in America right now. He's only one of the top three or four. Love him or hate him. Um, so I got into his junior high school days, his grade school days. I know his, we're the same age. I know his junior high school football coach. This is good stuff. Because um, he does not come across very open on, of course, the press conferences, as we know. Uh, so that's one reason why. Uh, another reason why is to see what the whole thing actually takes. What does it take to beat the Buckeyes? What does it take to beat Michigan State? Uh, right now they're 2-2 two and two against the Spartans. What does it take to win a Big Ten title? The investment from the players, the coaches, the staffers, all this. If it's not just about Harbaugh. Uh, it's about the whole machine that you need to have up and running to win a Big Ten title or at least compete for one. Uh, it's incredible. And the one comment everyone told me, and you already know this because you're on the bus, of course. You talk to all these guys with Jerry and so on. Talk to the staffers, the players, the parents, the coaches. The one thing that fans never get, they say, is how much effort this whole thing is. And it's incredible. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that blew me away is how many different people you talk to in this book. I mean, in going through it, it is remarkable the sheer number of voices adding their input from so many different points of view. Give us the process of kind of how you went about doing this. Uh, you're giving me too much credit. There was no process. It was a dumb luck. <laughs> <laughs> it was a nervous squirrel running around campus. There's a process. <laughs> That's the kind of process, we'll call that. Uh, when I start out my books, I really have no idea what they're really about. I know the question I'm going to ask. Uh, former editor of mine, I didn't like that much. I got along very well with most of them. But he always used to ask me, what's your angle? And I'd always say, I don't know yet. I've not talked to anybody yet. So if you're lucky, you talk to enough people and themes bubble up. Uh, and in this case, it was the staffers, the nutritionist, the strength coach, the recruiting guys, the academic guys, uh, all these guys who contribute to this whole process, which again applies to any Big Ten school. Um, but I started uh, interviews in July of last year, almost a year ago, and interviewed eight players. I had about 15 or 20 players, but boiled it down to eight players almost every week. And then started bouncing around, I realized, midway through the season to start talking to the parents and to start talking to the staffers. And the parents, by the way, you forget, these guys are kids. Um, these guys are 300 pounds. They're six foot five. And not, most of them can't bro grow a proper beard. <laughs> and they're not thinning like me, of course. So. <laughs> uh, so it was interesting to get that perspective as well. It is fascinating, some of those elements that you touched on. You mentioned recruiting a few moments ago. There's a significant portion of this book that is about recruiting about how the process works and maybe where it works better in some places than in others. What did you learn about recruiting in the course of writing this book? I learned that it is this utterly comprehensive part of the process that almost everyone is a part of. 
the nutritionist is part of recruiting. The strength coach is part of recruiting. All coaches, about a third of their job is recruiting all the time. Seven to nine, you're on the phone talking to recruits. I was stunned to learn that Michigan, like I'm sure other Big Ten schools, they start with 4,900 names, and somebody takes at least one look at every one of those guys on film. And then you boil that down to 300, bo- sorry, and then you boil it down to 300, um, and those guys all get a 10-minute tape put together by Michigan, uh, good plays and bad plays. Yeah, that was one thing I found really fascinating, was they, they, the worst moments they were looking at, too, right? <laughs> I thought that was really interesting, though, Don't right? give me your highlights. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's smart. I mean, you're going to drop, you know, what ends up being, here's another surprise, uh, how much Michigan pay, uh, spends on their, can we tell you this, by the way? Uh, how much Michigan spends on their players? Um, a fifth-year out-of-state player there for five years uh, will get almost $800,000, and half of that is tuition. Michigan, like Illinois, like Northwestern, they sign uh, the check. It goes up the hill. No discounts. They pay retail. Um, so for all that kind of money, if you're going to drop $800,000 on a player to play in your program, guess what? See his bad plays first before you recruit him. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. You get into the money component of it, and you discuss that quite a bit in the book. You discuss the amateurism model and, and whether or not you think that it works and, and actually put forth kind of a proposal mm-hmm. of your own what do you think of amateurism in college football? And, and after spending a year inside a program like Michigan, one of the, the best programs in the country, the winningest program in the history of college football, as we know, can these two coexist? Can amateurism and big-time college athletics go hand in hand? That's a great question. The crossroads is two things. How about that double crossroads? One is, is Harbaugh going to beat Ohio State? And he's right on the edge of breaking through. Is he going to do so? That's the crossroads there. Second one is, can you do it this way and still compete at the national level? Hard to say. Um, so I think there's great pressure on the amateur model. I'm old school, and a lot of folks will not agree. There's great impetus, I realize, to pay players in various ways, image uh, likenesses and so on. Um, but my theory is that even that will never quite get the job done the way you want it done. So my theory is you need to give high school basketball and football players the same thing we've given high school hockey, and baseball players for a century, and that is a viable minor league. So if you don't want to be a student, if you don't qualify to be a student, if you want to get paid, go right ahead. Um, Minor leagues will take you. They'll pay you more, Lord knows, and you've got a straight shot to the pros. And that separates the whole issue. College hockey is still immensely popular, as you guys know. Uh, College baseball is still very popular. Uh, I don't think it would detract from football or basketball. I think it would actually add to it. Uh, you'll notice that the NCAA is not calling me with my ideas. <laughs> but Perhaps that's my idea. Uh, y- you mentioned this notion of do you want to be there? And I, what, one of the things I found really interesting in the book was, and one of the things, frankly, I found really interesting in my time of going around the Big Ten. I want to hear this. And talking to student athletes is I think there's a lot of cynicism that surrounds that moniker, that student athlete moniker, and people say they're not students, let's stop this. If you sit down and talk to Big Ten football players about what they're studying and, you have. and what they're interested in, I, ha- I ask almost every guy that I mm-hmm. talk to at every preseason tour and at the lunch and every year, what are you studying? And the overwhelming majority of them can give you a really great response about why they're studying what they're studying and why they're interested in it and what they've taken from it. And I found a lot of that in your book, too. So give us a sense of how the student-athlete model exists in a program like Michigan. And it really does. And the Big Ten, by the way, needs to get kudos throughout the Big Ten. I think it's the highest plane academically of all the five major conferences. Um, and, it's, I mean, they're all in the Association of American Universities. That's highly prestigious, of course. Uh, they're serious about this stuff. And Devin Bush, Jr., of course, was asked by a student, you guys are playing a game and you guys are getting a free ride. He says, man, when you're on the beach, we're doing two-a-days. I remember that. Uh, yep. When you're on spring break, I'm in, you know, I'm in class catching up on what I've, you know, I had to catch up on. These guys are, tend to be very serious students. They take it very seriously as a conference, I think. Um, and they're insulted when you don't. And you've done it yourself across the Big Ten. This does apply. And I think uh, before we call it an oxymoron and put it in air quotes and so on, talk to them. Bruce Motti, the old SID for years at Michigan, had a great line. He said, the best ambassadors for college football are college football players. Talk to them before you assume anything. And you've done that. You bring up, uh, at the very beginning of the book, kind of a central question, and you've touched on it during our conversation here, and that is, is it worth it? That that was kind of one of the things that you wanted to talk to these guys about, along the lines of what Devin Bush is saying. Hey, you're off on the beach, and, and I'm you know, in the weight room or doing whatever it is to, to try to improve my game, doing strength, doing speed work, whatever. Uh, 
the question is, you know, maybe for the Devin Bushes, it's it's worth it because it's obvious, right. look, those guys, it's their pathway to the NFL mm -hmm. until that minor league exists. But but what I thought was interesting about the book is you asked big picture for everyone, mm -hmm. is it worth it for those who are going on to play in the NFL and for those whose career will end in Ann Arbor at one of these and other they know schools? It will. Yes. What, do you, what, what was the conclusion that was reached? Uh, it was very heartwarming. If you love college football, I recommend this book because you'll find out how it actually works behind the scenes. And also, uh, it's a lot safer than people are giving it credit for. I've talked to the doctors and the national experts. And it's more worthwhile than perhaps we give it credit for. And in all these cases, for different, different takes on it, but they all felt strongly that it was definitely worth it. They admit it's a ton of time. It's a ton of sacrifice. There is some risk involved. You can't remove all of that. Um, but each guy I talked to, Devin Bush used academics to become more confident as a player. He said, I was already All-American before I got here. I was not that great a student. I didn't take it seriously. I was okay. I just slid by. He tells his dad in the car one day, I want to be All-Big Ten this year. And his dad says, your grandmother will love that. And he actually busted it. He did it. And he got the call from the academic guy uh, in December saying, you did it. And Devin said, that meant as much to me as anything else I've done here at Michigan. To be an academic All-Big Ten. Academic All-Big Ten. Right. To be clear about that. And talking to Noah Furbush, who's getting his master's degree, right. designing a spaceship to go to Mars, just like I did as an undergrad. <laughs> <laughs> History made Probably had a lot of your same profession. Oh, I'm sure yeah. he did, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but he what now? I mean, obviously, he comes off great. And a key contributor on the team, but someone who is a very serious student. Absolutely, but also he pointed out, too, this guy's from Columbus. He's got one goal coming back his fifth year is to beat Ohio State. He said, we didn't do it. He said, I learned a hard lesson. Sometimes doing your absolute best is not enough. He does not spin the loss. They lost 62 to 39. And it's painful. And he said, it'll hurt the rest of my life. But he has got a master's degree in engineering, so he'll be okay. Um, <clears throat> on that topic, though, Grant Newsom, who had his knee blown out in the Wisconsin game, almost a sure NFLer, according to John Jansen, Dan Deardorff, and others, guys who know more than I do about this stuff, um, almost lost his leg. They got to him, luckily, very quickly, almost lost his leg. They saved it. He did come back. He could kind of do it again last summer, but not at the same level. He realized, I've got to step down. The touching scene where he's walking in his workout clothes in the far end of the field, about to call his dad and tell him, I gotta, I gotta drop this. And he's crying, his dad's crying, his mom's crying. Gotta talk to Harbaugh and tell him as well. Uh, a year later, I asked him, was it worth it? Because you, you, know, you almost lost your leg, this tremendous process, you're not going to the NFL, obviously. He said, I would not have traded a minute of it. And that is your acid test. And his dad gave me the best quote, or one of them, in the book. He said, our son is not prepared for whatever this world can possibly throw at him. He's academic, all Big Ten. He's getting a great degree in the Ford School and the master's program there. Uh, he's gone through things that 50-year-olds don't go through. He is ready for anything. And that's when my wife and I decided our four-year-old kid, he's bigger, faster, and more talented than his dad, uh, if he wanted to play football, I would say yes. And I was not sure until that moment. Um, if Leon Newsom's dad, you know, Leon Newsom can say about Grant Newsom, this has, this has paid off for us. I think there's your acid test right there. Uh, you are a chronicler of Michigan football, and you know the program inside and out. So I want to remove ourselves from the book for a moment and talk about the season that's coming up. Sure. How much pressure you think is on Jim Harbaugh? <laughs> as much as there, as there has ever been. Uh, I can tell you this. However, I don't know how much of it he feels. This is a guy who, when playing a game of chess with his brother in his dad's hospital room in 2016 after his dad is recovering from heart attack surgery, uh, they were screaming at each other over who had the most wins. So I don't think the external pressure is any worse than what Jim feels himself. His wife, Sarah, told me a great story. The plumber's over there to work on their pool. And he says on the way out, oh, yeah, tell your husband to be sure to beat the Buckeyes this year. And she says, I'll pass that on. <laughs> <laughs> it might not have occurred to him. Yeah. <laughs> well, if the guy who worked on the pool wants to, uh, I guess we'll have to do something. So the pressure is uh, nationally it's, it's, it's as high as it's been. I mean, it's, you know, Fisher cut bait time, basically, to the national press, I think, till some of the fan base. That's growing. You know? Do you really believe there's a sentiment for that? I mean, you say Fisher cut fan? bait. I mean, the, the implication would be if they don't win it this year that <clears throat> there's some sort of separation? There will be none of that, I guarantee you. This is the national media talking. Right. At Michigan, it's, the AD is the only vote. The vote's right. won nothing. It's Ward Manual, and he's not wiggling a little bit. And nor should he. Anybody's talking about, I think speaking objectively here as a journalist, about removing Harbaugh for whom and for what? Do you recall what it was like in 2014? <laughs> Do you recall three and nine? Do you recall this stuff? 
Uh, he is by far the best candidate Michigan can get, and they'd be very arrogant to move on from this. I, I see no sign of that. Okay, so let me ask you this. They're in the midst of, as you know, their longest conference title drought ever. It's tied for the longest drought. 14 years. They have ever had. Does it end this season? Does Michigan end up Big Ten champs? I would say the odds this season are as good as they've been under Harbaugh. I think, looking at it objectively, it comes down to the Ohio State game. Um, right now, in late August, they are slightly favored. What does that mean? We'll find out in late November. Uh, I would say if you had to pull back, you'd probably pick them number one, and right now they are pick number one. Uh, but, man, as Bo told me years ago, damn it, Bacon, the damn ball is pointy. <laughs> <laughs> the point being, you've you got to stay healthy. You can't lose to somebody you're supposed to beat. You, you're going to play Michigan State. You're going to play Notre Dame. You're going to play uh, Penn State on the road, Wisconsin on the road. These are not gimmies. Uh, so it's a tough road. I would say the chances are as good as they've been under Harbaugh so far. Anything else you would want people to know about this book as they ponder a purchase? Great line from Matt Dudek, the recruiting coordinator. He told me that there are 8,760 hours in a year, and the fans and the media see 60. And this is about the 8,700 hours that you don't see. The class work, I'm in the classes with them, the dining hall at their apartments, which are no better than mine, I'm pleased to report, <laughs> <laughs> back in the day. Ben Bettison's parents, by the way, before the Ohio State game, the parents of all the guys who live in that house, they cleaned the house before the Ohio State game. That must have taken a SWAT team, I think, a hazmat crew. <laughs> they put Christmas lights all around it. They put uh, beer in the fridge and Thanksgiving leftovers. So after the game, win or lose, they'd have something to come home to. They were at rock bottom, of course, when they got off the bus. They see the lights. They see the food. They get the beer. And they said, this makes all the difference in the world. These are the kind of stories you get in the other 8,700 hours. Well, the book is exactly what you would expect from John U. Bacon. Over time, Jim Harbaugh and the Michigan Wolverines at the crossroads of college football comes out September 3rd. But the beauty of this world is you can pre-order it. So we encourage you to do just that. John, thanks as always for your time. Great to see you. Dave, thank you.